Welcome back to another episode of Organic Chemistry. Today is another video in the Toxic series where we're going to talk about this really terrible journal with this really fake article. So here you can see the journal's website. It's called the World Journal of Pharmaceutical Research. It turns out that the chemistry present in these papers actually shows up on SciFinder and I had originally come across this journal in 2015. It was surprising because I had tried to repeat this reaction reported in this journal I mean, look at this like website. This looks extremely reputable, right? This looks like something you'd expect to see in 2015, uh, especially in 2022. And I tried to reproduce this paper and didn't work. So one thing that's kind of funny about this journal is they have the best paper awards and they give their best paper award to every uh, issue. And the funny thing is if you click the download article button, you get this interesting not found thing. And it says, you seem to be trying to find his way home. And I don't know why I'm trying to find his way home, but hopefully he finds his way home. Okay, so let's look at this paper. This paper is called Synthesis, Characterization, and Mi Antimicrobial Activity of Substituted Benzodioxal Derivatives. And so essentially what this paper does is they say they make some novel derivatives of orthohydroxyaniline, or orthoaminophenol if you prefer, by reacting this with dicarboxylic acids in the presence of hydrochloric acid. Now, if you're familiar with heterocycle chemistry at all, Phil Barron has a really good course on heterocycle synthesis. You might uh, expect that this type of reaction would work. And on paper, this is fairly reasonable. You know, you're trying to form a five-membered ring. There's acid that could help protonate the carbonyl of the carboxylic acid after it's formed an ester or an amide. It's conceivable that this type of transformation would occur. Um, but this reaction doesn't actually work. And we're going to look through some of the problems with this paper. So I've highlighted things throughout that we're going to look at. So the first thing I want to point out is it says a series of some novel benzodioxal compounds were synthesized. Um, so the first thing I want to point out is of these five derivatives that I made, you can look up their structure on SciFinder. We'll just go back down here so you can see what they look like. The R group that sticks off is coming off here so you can see the five examples. The first compound, compound A, was actually first reported in 1922. Compound B was reported in 1956. Compound C was reported in 1986. Compound D was reported in 1922, and compound E was reported in 1945. So the first, the first thing that we already know is an issue is they call this a series of some novel benzodioxal compounds, but we already know that those aren't novel, so that's not a great start. Now I'm going to gloss over most of the grammar mistakes here or missing spaces because they're just kind of everywhere, and I'm sure that's going to be upsetting to you guys the whole time. Okay, so the next thing it says is the reaction of orthoaminophenol with dicarboxylic acid yield substituted benzodioxal. And so you can see most of these actually aren't disubstituted acids. There's three of them. Three of them are, okay, so most of them are, but there's a couple exceptions which aren't. This would be derived from cinnamic acid, and this one would be derived from salicylic acid. So they're not diacids, so that's not technically true either. Additionally, they say that their structures were confirmed by IR, 1H NMR, and 13C NMR. They also tested antimicrobial activity against Staphylococcus aureus which is a bacteria that commonly you might study like antimicrobial activity for. And so they say for the synthesized compounds. Now we're going to get back to that because on the agar plates that they tested this on, they actually don't label them as the derivatives. They just label them as the parent compounds that were the carboxylic acids that these things were converted into allegedly. So in this thing, they say uh, in the present synthesis or in the present study, it is planned to synthesize benzodioxal compounds and characterize these compounds by one IR, 1HNMR, and 13CNMR spectral analysis. It is planned to is a little bit misleading. Does that mean that they didn't already do it? Or did they say that we did this? This is confusing as well. So they just have some like random stuff that you typically see in the start of a paper. Now, a couple other concerning things here. In their methods and materials section, they say all melting points were taken in open capillaries and are uncorrected. Elemental analysis was performed on a Perkin-Elmer analyzer. So they don't report melting points anywhere, and they also don't have any elemental analysis. So we'll just quickly go through here. You don't see anything that looks like an elemental analysis or uh, melting point. So I don't know why they have that in there. If they did melting point and elemental analysis and they didn't include it, that wasn't a very helpful thing to let us know, was it? Okay, so as I said before, it says that they were condensed with dicarboxylic acids, but the majority of them aren't dicarboxylic acids. Now here you can see they give you a bit of a procedure that you can follow. I tried this procedure with oxalic acid and when I analyzed all of the products that I got, they were all just started unreacted. 
uh, orthoaminophenol. Now that doesn't mean that this reaction isn't conceivable. I bet you could find conditions to make this transformation occur. It is totally conceivable to me that you could take oxalic acid and orthoaminophenol and you could get it to convert, but I wasn't able to under the conditions that they report. Okay. So here you can see that these structures look a little bit weird. In normal papers, you're going to have structures that are all the same size. Here, they managed to get a different benzene ring size almost every single time, so that's a little bit concerning. They also don't have subscripts for the CH2. So this is just like poor presentation. You know, maybe we can let that one go. So down here, they say uh, table one, analytical data of benzodioxyl compounds. Now, they say analytical data, but they actually don't give us any analytical data other than the yield. But fortunately, they do give us the molecular formula uh, as well as the molecular weight. And at least we can see that the molecular weights are correct for these molecular formulas. Now, once we start talking about the IR frequencies of the products, this is where we start running into some real issues. So the first one I want to highlight is the C single bond C. So if you look at any IR tables, you're not going to see C single bond C stretches because those aren't analytically useful. Everything we look at should have C single bond C stretches almost entirely. Like the only thing I could think of that wouldn't have a C single bond C stretch would be something like ethylene or uh, or maybe like acetylene, right? Or aline. So that's not a super helpful thing to include. Okay, now let's look at the C double bond O stretches. So here they don't have a C single uh, C double bond O stretch, even though compound B should have a carboxylic acid product. So they just don't see that C double bond O stretch. So that's concerning. Okay, down here for compound E, they say they have a C double bond O stretch, but compound E is a is a, like an alkene derivative. There's no carbonyl, so there shouldn't even be a C double bond O stretch for that. Now, another concerning thing is they give us an OH stretch for compound E. Now, compound E also doesn't have an OH. It has a C double bond N, a C single bond O, and just like a C double bond C. So not super helpful to give us an OH stretch for something that doesn't have an OH stretch. Additionally, I want to point out that if you have an OH stretch, this is typically like 3300, uh, inverse centimeters. This wouldn't be like 2800. An OH stretch is typically like further to the left. So that's a little bit concerning too. Now in this next uh, table, they give us the NMR frequencies of the synthesized compounds. Okay, they tell us it's in table three right after they tell us it's table three. That's pretty helpful to know that like they do the same thing up here where they're talking about what's in table two right after telling us it is table two. Okay. So here you can see that the chemical shift in ppm for this CH2 is 2.5 ppm. Now they give us a lot of decimal places. This isn't standard practice, but you know we'll, we'll let that go as well. Now the weird thing here is if we look at compound B, we should actually have two different CH2s. And the CH2 that's closer to the benzoxazole is going to have a different chemical shift than the one that's next to the carboxylic acid. So it's too bad that they only told us where one of the CH2s is. It would have been really nice if they could have given us all of that data. Now, another concerning thing here is you can see for compound E, they give us a COOH chemical shift. Now, presumably they're talking about the OH, but you know they, they could have just kind of grouped all of these into one column. And you can see at least they figured out only one of their compounds has an OH in this table, even though, uh, or at least like a phenol OH in this table. But in the previous table, they didn't really make the connection that, oh, we should probably make our data make sense. So here you can see they say compound E has a COOH stretch, but let's go to compound E again. Yeah, that's right. There's no COOH. And if there is a COOH, that's just their unreacted cinnamic acid starting material. Okay, so that's concerning too. Now let's look at table four. The following table, table four, shows the 13C NMR frequencies of the synthesized compounds A to E. So here you can see it says the chemical shift of sp2 carbon in ppm. So if we look at these carbons, there's several sp2 carbons in the starting materials and the products. Uh, from both of the benzene rings. Uh, and so there wouldn't just be one sp2 carbon, there'd be plenty of sp2 carbons. Additionally, if you've ever done a carbon NMR, you'll know that sp2 carbons tend to be more in the range of like 100 ppm-ish, give or take 50, you know, probably closer to like 150 if you have something like uh, like a carbonyl. Uh, and if you have an aromatic carbon, sometimes it could be like 70, but 40 is extremely low. That's like too low for a typical sp2 carbon. Okay, so that's concerning, but they fortunately give us the chemical shift of the carbonyl carbon, which uh, would also be an sp2 carbon, but hey, you know, that's okay, we'll let that one go. And you can see that for compound D and E, they give us uh, chemical shifts, but the problem is those don't actually have carbonyls. So you can see they have the imine or the uh, benzoxazole nitrogen double bond carbon, um, but then these don't have carbonyls. Uh, so that's, that's a problem. 
Okay, let's continue. So they do some studies. Uh, they basically absorb their compounds, which they say are the products, but to me, I could very well assume these are the starting materials, on these like little paper discs. And then if the bacteria, when it grows on the agar, doesn't like those compounds, it basically won't be able to grow there. So this is the inhibition zone. This is where the bacteria tends to not grow if you have something like an antibiotic like they're using here. Okay, so they have a standard, they have a control, and then they have their compound that they're testing. So the control shouldn't have any, like, um, any zone of inhibition because the bacteria can just grow there. The standard is an antibiotic, and then the stuff that they add uh, just, just maybe antimicrobial to some extent. So here you can see that they label this antimicrobial activity of compound A and B. So let's go back up for a second. So compound A should be derived from oxalic acid. Compound B should be derived from succinic acid. So let's see what they label those plates. So the first one says cinnamic acid, and the second one says phthalic acid. So that's a problem. The first one should be oxalic acid, the second one should be succinic acid. And it seems that they've got this messed up for all of their compounds. This one should be phthalic acid, this one should be salicylic acid, and this one should be cinnamic acid. And so we can also see that their conclusions are going to be wrong because, you know, here this says cinnamic acid, oxalic acid. And so what they're concluding from these studies about having any antimicrobial activity is actually wrong because they've got their figures mixed up from the compounds that they're talking about. So that's a problem too. So here they give you the zone of inhibition for each of the compounds. They measure how many millimeters uh, of repulsion they were able to get against the bacteria. And they're just assuming that this is a way to say this is a good antimicrobial agent that you'd want to use uh, versus the standard, which is an actual antibiotic. Okay, they give us a graph of the same data. So, that, so that's helpful. They just showed this twice just in case, you know, you didn't see it the first time. Now you can look at it with some bar graphs, some nice uh, Excel uh, graphs you got going on. And so in their discussion, they say, the purity and homogeneity of all of the synthesized compounds were confirmed by their column chromatography. Now, you could say that the purity was improved by column chromatography, but you can't, you, like, you can't confirm their purity by column chromatography. That, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't make sense. Additionally, they say another confusing here, an, another confusing thing here, saying the presence of NH stretching was confirmed by peaks at 3,100 to 3,200 uh, inverse wave numbers. So that's concerning, too, because there shouldn't be NHs in any of those products. Let's look at these again. Okay, so there's a C double bond N and a C single bond N. There's no NH. So if they're seeing NHs in their products, that just suggests that they had unreacted starting material every single time. So that's concerning as well. Additionally, they give us another NH stretch. Even though they just talked about an NH stretch, they give us a second NH stretch. We, we don't know if it's a stretch. It could be a bend. Who knows? They don't tell us. And they also give us a carbonyl stretch. Now, they're not talking about a specific compound here. So I don't know really what the point of talking about different stretches from different molecules is in a single sentence. That's quite a confusing and not logical thing to do. And so here they talk about that they have an OH proton at 12.4 ppm. And so let's just say from one of their compounds, they had an OH at 12.4 ppm. Let's go back to their proton NMR table for a sec. So yeah, so here we can see a COOH, nothing around 12 ppm. And then they have another OH here at 9 ppm. So that's also in disagreement with their earlier results. So that's also a cause for concern. Fortunately, they tell us that they have a CH at 8.4 ppm, as well as an aryl proton at 7 to 7.6. But uh, what kind of CH are they seeing if it's not an aryl proton? And also, the aryl protons that they talk about aren't in agreement with this. So that's concerning as well. Uh, finally, they say that one of their conclusions is that IR, 1H NMR, and 13 NMR uh, spectra are taken. I, I hope they get them back. I really do. Um, additionally, they show the structure of the product as follows. And so they show the structure. Okay, that's reasonable, sure. And that's the end of this. So I checked, you know, I initially looked at this in 2015, but I looked on SciFinder yesterday, and you can still see this reaction. World Journal of Pharmaceutical Research showing up on SciFinder, even though this is like a garbage journal. Okay, so you remember that, like, let's click on the paper to see what the most popular paper is from this issue. Well, when I clicked on that in 2015, I got linked to this great journal. And so this journal, uh, or this article is called um, Role of Endometrial Thickness Optimization in the Pregnancy Rate for Infertile Women Undergoing IUI Using Different Ovulation Induction Protocols. And so this is a really funny one that I'm not going to cover, but if you're interested in it, I'll post it in the Discord. And you can also see that they have one of the best R-squareds I've ever seen in a published paper. You might be familiar that typically you want an R-squared that's like, you know, 95, 0.95 or higher. Uh, and here they have a really good R squared that's like not even outside, not even inside the box of 0 
Uh, and look at that slope. Damn, that's a good slope. So uh, this is the best that this journal has. At least in 2015, this is the best that they have. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I hope you have a great day.